Hey everyone, I'm Shaw, and in this video, I'm gonna walk through the data science resume that actually got me hired. And so I've worked as a data scientist in three different arenas, in research, in freelance, and now in corporate. And through this experience, I've gotten a good sense of what the day-to-day -day of a typical data scientist looks like and what it takes to be successful in a data science role. So the whole motivation for this video is that I know a lot of people these days are trying to get that first data science job. That first job, in any industry is always the hardest to get. You know, it's that old story of you need experience to get a job, but you need a job to get experience. And so the goal of this video is to talk through the resume that actually worked and got me hired and share the principles and tips that helped me craft the resume, as well as things that I did outside of the resume to help me land the job. And so be sure to stick around to the end because I'm gonna talk about five specific things that you can do to increase your value as a candidate beyond the essentials of a resume. So I wanna start by asking, what is the goal of a resume? And so it might sound obvious. You might say, the goal of a resume is to get the job, or the goal of a resume is to describe my experience. The goal of a resume is to say why I'm a great fit for this role. So while there are many goals of a resume, the one that I found the most clear and helpful is that the goal of a resume is to get the interview. And the reason why I think this way of thinking about it is important is because people get so wrapped up in trying trying to jam pack every little detail into their resume with the intention of trying to come across as a more attractive candidate. But ironically, when you put way too much information, especially information that's not relevant to the role, it actually makes you a less compelling candidate. Which brings me to my foundational principle of crafting a resume, which is less is more. The way I see it, the person reading your resume has a finite amount of attention that they're going to give to your resume. So you've got about seven seconds to convey not so much who you are as a person and every little detail of your experience, but rather your goal in that seven seconds is to be someone interesting, be someone that they want to reach out to, be someone that they want to set up an interview with. And so as we walk through my old resume, we're going to see this principle of less is more come up through the design and the content of the resume. So let's see what this looks like. Okay, so here is the resume. So this was for my current role, which is is a data scientist at Toyota Financial Services. And so you can see this is a very simple resume, no pictures, no colors, just to the point. So I'm gonna talk through four things that I think were good here. So the first one isn't something I included, but something I did not include, which was this objectives section that you might see on other resumes. And so just thinking back to this principle of less is more, and that you have a finite amount of the reader's attention. Do you want to spend that that finite attention for them to read a paragraph of objectives? Or do you want to save that attention for some impressive projects you may have done further down in your resume? So for me, I don't see any utility in having an objective section for data science roles. The second thing I think was good here is I added this technical skills section. And not only do I have this section, I have it at the top of the resume. And so I think one thing that's happening is if a human is reading your resume, they are are looking for specific skills, especially in data science. They want to know, can this person code in Python? Do they have SQL experience? Do they have cloud computing experience? You know, they're looking for these types of things. And so don't make them hunt for these keywords because they're going to be so focused on trying to find Python in this wall of text here that they're going to miss everything else. So just give it to them at the beginning so they can relax their mind. They're like, okay, great. This person can code in Python. That's all we use on our team. So now with that sense of relief, they can actually read your resume with an open mind. The third thing is pretty standard, which is these bullet points and how you craft these bullet points. And so the format that I've been taught and that I found helpful is to start with a strong action verb. And then there are resources online that give you like strong action verb ideas for these types of bullet points. You start with a strong action verb, what you did, and have some kind of quantifiable impact associated with that thing. So here I put conducted data collection processing and analysis for novel study evaluating the impact of over 300 biometric variables on human performance in hyper-realistic live fire training scenarios. So that sounds really interesting, but I will say one thing that's missing here is the quantifiable impact. So what was the result of this work? 
Just stop and ask yourself that question of any bullet point you have on here. It's like, why is this important in a larger context? And I would even say, if you can't think of a wider impact of any bullet point, consider just dropping it and picking up something else that has a higher impact. And so if I was to do this over again, I would think a bit more carefully about the impact of this bullet point here. And here's a corollary to that. Anytime you can put numbers in these bullet points, it just stands out. Like you might see clickbaity blogs out there like five ways to lose weight fast or seven secrets that will make you a more attractive mate or something like that. There's a reason they put numbers in the titles is because our minds are attracted to that. When you see a bunch of letters, the numbers stand out and it gets your attention. And so use numbers, especially if you can have a quantifiable impact. Like here, this is a better example. Analyze marketing and sales reports to inform inventory acquisition, which resulted in a 50% decrease in average inventory age. That's a quantifiable impact. And that's the type of bullet point you want to have for everything. And then the fourth thing is a really small thing, but I think it does make a difference. In addition to listing your technical skills here, bold them in each of these bullet points. So this was actually something I picked up from a Google hiring manager when I was in the looking for a job phase of my life in grad school. He was actually the one that also told me to put technical skills at the top. And then he additionally said bold these things. Because again, if the person reading your resume is looking for something specific, don't make it hard for them to find it. Those are the four things that I liked. As far as things that I would do differently or improve upon, one I already mentioned, which is a lot of these bullet points don't have any kind of quantifiable impact. They have the strong action verb, they have the technical task that I'm trying to convey, but there's no impact. The second thing that I would improve on this resume is that notice that it's a two pager. And so there's debate on whether a resume should ever be two page, should it always be one page, I'm not going to get into that. But specifically here, I might consider dropping the talks and outreach, maybe even the awards and honors here, and then just have an abridged version of the publications just to bring it down to one page and just try to make it a bit more concise. Just to recap, the four things that I thought were good here were no objective section, putting the technical skills at the top so the reader doesn't have to hunt for it, having these strong action verb thing, then quantifiable impact on the end, and then and finally building these key skills again so the reader doesn't have to hunt for them and then as far as the two things that I would improve upon is to reevaluate these two bullet points so they do have quantifiable impact and two, try to remove some of these sections so this could just be a one-page resume instead of a two-pager another key point with the whole job application process and hiring process is to always ask for feedback no matter what even if you don't get the role ask for feedback in the interviews even if you don't get the interview ask for feedback if you can get in contact with a person. And so toward that end, when I had that first interview with the hiring manager, like that initial interview before you get to the technical interviews and panel interviews and all that kind of stuff, I asked a simple question to the hiring manager, which was, why me? What stood out about my resume? What made you think I was a good fit for this role? And so I find that a very good question to ask in any kind of hiring process, because now you're getting a little bit of insight into their world. You're seeing what their problems are and how they see see you fitting into that world. And so the hiring manager mentioned two things that stood out about my resume that he liked. The first was PhD. And if you don't have a PhD or you're not pursuing a PhD, you might think, okay, wow, that's not helpful at all. But I will say in my experience, it seems that graduate degrees do open a lot of doors and opportunities. So even if we're talking about a master's degree and not a PhD, having these advanced degrees definitely help differentiate you from other candidates. And then the second second thing that stood out wasn't so much the resume itself because again really all that seemed to stand out was the PhD okay he knows Python let's talk to this person but the other thing that stood out was I had this website here and so we can click on this and it takes you to an actual website having a website a home page an online portfolio is a great way to just stand out as a candidate and so this is being hosted completely for free using github pages and I actually in the last video on my channel, I have a whole walkthrough guide on how you can spit up a website completely for free using GitHub pages. So just having a portfolio website can help differentiate you from other candidates. And it doesn't even have to be as sophisticated as this. So this took me about a weekend to spin together using this open source drag and drop website builder called MobiRise. So I use this MobiRise, it's like a drag and drop interface to build a website, it's completely free. But you don't have to go through all this trouble.
level. So GitHub Pages gives you these great themes to spin up a website from a markdown file. So still no coding involved whatsoever, but the result in like 15 minutes of filling out a readme file, you can spin up a good looking website that can also help differentiate you from other candidates. And so that was the resume. And as we saw, based on the hiring manager feedback, it wasn't just the resume that stood out. It was also this portfolio. So this is a great point because you have to realize the resume isn't everything. There's so much more beyond the resume that goes into the hiring process. And everyone has the resume. But when you're trying to stand out, when you're trying to get the interview, a lot of times it pays not so much to be a better candidate, but to be a different candidate. And what I mean by that is it pays to stand out, to distinguish yourself as a candidate for a role. And so we already talked about one way to do this, which is a website portfolio. But even beyond the resume and beyond the portfolio, there's still more that can be done. And so what I'm talking about here is networking. So a great way to do this is LinkedIn. If you have a role that you're interested in, go on LinkedIn and try to find people that work at that company. Try to find people that work on that team. Try to find people working in HR at that company. And just try to make contact with a human. Even though it's not going to work out every time, that 20 percent of the time that you actually get connected with someone and start talking to someone that's in the company, this can have a very significant impact on your probability of getting the job. So if you're sitting there and you're like, Shaw, you're not telling me anything I don't know. I have the resume. I have the portfolio. I reached out to 200 people in the last three months on LinkedIn and still I'm not getting anywhere. So if that's the case, a lot of times what's happening here is you need more experience. You need more development as a data scientist, which brings us back to the dilemma I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I need experience to get a job, but I need a job to get experience. But I don't think that's the case necessarily. I can think of five things you can do to get more experience as a data scientist and make yourself a more attractive candidate for these data science roles. And so the first one might sound obvious, which is education. And so this is a lot of go-tos for people. You're applying to data science jobs with a bachelor's degree and you're not getting anywhere. Maybe get that master's degree. Maybe get that certification. If you have the certification master's degree and it's still not working out for you, maybe go for another certification or maybe go for a PhD. But I'll just caveat this. If you're getting a degree just to get a job, I don't think that's going to be the right answer most of the time. The second thing you can do is independent projects. If you don't have enough experience as a data scientist, get the experience by coming up with projects. Go find some data on the web. Build a web scraper and gather data and start building interesting data sets so you can do interesting data science projects and put that on your resume, put that on your portfolio. The third thing that you can do that I found very helpful is to make content, write blogs on Medium, publish them in towards data science, make YouTube videos like this where you're explaining data science topics, where you're explaining your data science projects and you're displaying your competency and people have something tangible they can click on on your portfolio or you can refer them to with a link. And beyond just being something you share with people, sometimes these blogs and videos, they take on a life of their own and people start coming to you asking you questions about this stuff and maybe even offering you jobs. The fourth thing you can do that seems to be becoming more and more popular these days isn't so much doing more data science projects or going back to school, but just hosting on LinkedIn. And so I've seen a lot of people working in data roles or still in school, building a following and building an audience on LinkedIn. And through that growth, they're getting a lot of visibility and this leads them to getting job offers. And so this is interesting because you don't necessarily need to be developing your skills further. You just need to be showing off the knowledge and skills that you already have. And then the fifth option is you can start freelancing. And so I really like this option because if your goal is to get a full-time data science role, when freelancing on a website like Upwork, you're getting a lot of interview reps. And the time it takes you to apply to 10 full-time roles, you can apply to 100 Upwork roles. So you're getting 10 times the experience writing resumes, writing cover letters, doing interviews than you do otherwise. And so you can really develop that skill set quickly. And another benefit of freelancing, you get experience by working on real world projects that aren't just for education, but are making an impact for your clients and is putting money in your pocket. And so I hope this video was helpful for you in trying to land that first data science role and break into the field. If you enjoyed this content, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing with others. If you have any questions about data science or career stuff, please feel free to drop those in the comment section below. I do read all the comments and try to answer to all the questions that I receive. And as always, thank you so much for your time and thanks for watching.